Okay, well, we're about a minute past advertised starting time. So why don't we kick things off tonight? Welcome um, to PSRC's Regional Transportation Plan uh, virtual public meeting. My name is Ben McKenna. I'm the Director of Regional Planning. And um, just wanted to start tonight off by um, letting you all know who are attending that um, participants are automatically muted. We really want to hear your questions, though. So please use the question and answer um, feature that you can find at the icon on the bottom of the screen. Um, we'll be, we have plenty of time towards the end of this to answer questions. So um, we also will be launching a couple of polls just to kind of get a sense of who's attending and um, what your primary transportation is, um, interests are. So if you have the latest version of Zoom that should work for you, a, a pop-up box will, will come up on screen and you can um, select your, your make, select your answers and then submit. Um, but those will happen a bit later. So before that, let me introduce Kelly McGurdy. Kelly is the Director of Regional Planning. Uh, I'm sorry, she's the Director of Transportation Planning at PSRC. Um, and she will be pr providing today's presentation um, and helping to answer questions. So take it away, Kelly. All right, thanks, Ben, and welcome, everyone. Um, so we're gonna give a, a little overview of who we are, for those of you who may not be familiar with us, walk through the draft regional transportation plan, which is out for public comment. We'll share some of the outreach activities that we uh, conducted and what we've heard leading up to the development of the plan, give you some quick highlights of plan performance, and then walk through some of the materials on our website and our online open house. And as Ben mentioned, we have a couple of polls to uh, get us started. But first, for those of you who may not be familiar with us, who is Puget Sound Regional Council? We are a long range planning agency. We are mandated under both federal and state law. And we do, we focus on three areas, growth planning, economic development planning, and transportation planning. We also have competitive processes to distribute federal transportation dollars. We do this on a two year basis. And we do a lot of data. We do a lot of data and analysis and forecasting things into the future. And perhaps most importantly, we are a forum for all of the decision makers and stakeholders around our four county region to come together and discuss regional issues and do, long, do this long range planning. We have, I believe, over 100 members now, and it represents the, the four counties in the Puget Sound region, King, Kitsap, Pierce, and Snohomish. Uh, all of the cities and towns, the various ports and transit agencies, as well as state agencies and tribal governments. And we also have participation at our table from community business and environment groups. So let's start off with our first fall, excuse me, our first poll and tell us about where in the central Puget Sound region do you live? Michaela, take it away. Okay, it looks like um, we have it looks like we have maybe about 10 people in the room thus far and then it looks like the majority about half of you are in King County, but a good spread from around the region. So why, why do we do what we do? Um, I'm sure many of you are aware that we have been a really fast growing uh, region historically. This was certainly true before the pandemic. We have continued to grow, although at a more modest pace during the pandemic, but we do expect and forecast 1.6 million more people by 2050 and 1.1 million more jobs. And our long range plans address the needs of the residents who live here today and the jobs that we have here today, as well as accommodating this growth. Vision 2050 was adopted in October of 2020 and vision is our overarching policy framework document. It really guides the work of the, of the region. Uh, it has policies that cover uh, a number of different topic areas from growth management to transportation to the environment to housing to development patterns. Uh, and it is the uh, it is also our regional growth strategy. So how and where do we want that those 1.6 million more people and 1.1 million more jobs to be in the region up to 2050? The regional transportation plan and the regional economic strategy are uh, built from the policies and the goals and the actions in Vision 2050, and we consider them the functional implementation plans within those categories. 
And today, of course, we are here to chat with you about the draft regional transportation plan that is going from today, 2022, out to 2050. And as we mentioned, it is out on the street for public comment right now. So when we sat down with our uh, transportation policy board early on in the development of this plan, we really wanted to lay out some of the objectives. And these were the, the two kind of big picture objectives that we knew that we would keep in mind as we were developing the plan. First is that while we are planning for that growth out to 2050, we also know we have real challenges uh, in the system today. So acknowledging that and planning for that. We also know that we have a unique opportunity with this particular time frame to get in front of the upcoming local comprehensive plan updates by our cities and counties. And so we are doing our best to provide better data and analysis to support that local, that next level of local planning. In addition, we are planning out to 2050. And as I mentioned, we have real challenges today. We're planning for that growth to come, but there's also an opportunity to think big, think about what's next for the system and get ahead of some of those, those additional planning, um, planning work and those, those additional new investments that might come online in the future. This could be uh, new or more passenger only ferries. It could be uh, further extensions of, of high-speed rail. It could be uh, uh, addressing the, the capacity needs at the airport. In addition, the board wanted to focus in on a few key emphasis areas, and this is very much building from all of the good work that was done under Vision 2050. These are the six key policy areas that are really reflected throughout each element of the draft plan. The first one is access to transit. You'll see in a moment and you'll see in the draft plan that there is a significant expansion of the transit system coming by 2050. Building that network is critical. But we also need to address making sure that, that people have the ability to access that transit system and not just by a private vehicle. Safety is a critical component, as you all, I'm sure, are aware that the trends are not going um, in the downward, downward slope that we would like for it to see. And so safety is another aspect of, that is uh, addressed throughout the plan. Equity, making sure that all of our residents have uh, access to a, a reliable, well-maintained transportation system and also addressing some of the, the gaps and the historic disparities that we've seen in the region. Climate, the state and the region have climate goals by 2050 and how can the regional transportation plan help get us there with, with on-road transportation. And then these, these last two bullets really get back to those two objectives, identifying each of our member jurisdictions, they have local agency needs, and then also thinking big and thinking into the future about what is the next big thing coming at us by 2050. So I mentioned um, a moment ago about this is an opportunity for us to provide better data and support for the, the uh, upcoming comprehensive plan updates. And this slide is reflecting some work that we did. We spent a lot of time gathering a lot of data about the existing system. And for those of you who aren't familiar with us, um, we are a very large region. We cannot track at PSRC, we cannot track every single um, facility on the system. So for example, we don't uh, track the investments or the condition of the local roadways in front of your house. But we set, a, we set a threshold above which the, the, the larger kind of uh, capacity carrying elements of the system, that is the level at, at which we track. And so when we collected our data, so for example, for the first time ever, we have a sidewalk inventory. It is sidewalks on arterials and above. We have a bicycle lane and uh, uh, regional trail inventory. We have information on the signals, the traffic signals throughout the region. We have information on all of the transportation demand management programs and information on uh, services for uh, uh, residents who require specialized transportation services. We, get, we gathered a lot of really great information and we put it into what we're calling our transportation system visualization tool. And this is an opportunity to put all of that data and view that data in context of other um, regional information. So for example, demographic data, we can see where there are gaps in the system compared to where there are uh, higher percentages of people with low income, for example. The, the screenshot in front of you is an example of we can look at where the existing sidewalks and bicycle facilities are in relationship to where transit stops are and where, where are the gaps, where are the needs. We've done this both for the existing conditions and then for those projects that do reach our radar, we have a forecast looking at what are the planned projects 
And we can also take a look at that in relationship to the planned growth and where we expect that growth, growth to occur. So this is an opportunity for our member jurisdictions and members of the public to zoom into their area and kind of see what's going on today and what, what is being planned for the future. So I mentioned we've already done an, uh, a lot of outreach. So we started with an online survey and we really asked residents, what is it that they need from the transportation system for their, for their use? What are the challenges and the barriers they're experiencing today? What would they like to see? We also had some questions related to the pandemic and their comfort level and what, what would it take to um, use transit more often? We, re we had great feedback. We received about 1900 respondents from our representative public survey. We did follow-up interviews and I believe we reached uh, folks from with uh, four uh, different languages other than English. We did outreach to youth. So we met with four um, youth groups around the region, one in each county. We've done a lot of virtual outreach meetings. There's been a lot of work reaching out to uh, seniors and people with disabilities and, and those residents who do require some specialized transportation services. We also put that same representative public survey on our website and opened it up more broadly. And we got an additional 1,400 um, responses. So we've we've received a lot of really great feedback and we are continuing down that path to, to hear from more people. And here's, a, here's some snapshots of what we've been hearing. There's a lot of bullets on this slide and I won't read all of them, but there have been some consistent themes from all of the feedback that we've heard. Um, and, some, and then they're very practical information that is very useful information for our member jurisdictions. Folks are interested in having reliable, well-maintained roads and highways, for example. They are interested in having a well-connected and expanded transit network. They would like complete bicycle and pedestrian facilities. Um, kind of leaning into some of the, the requirements and the needs for folks who do have special transportation needs, those um, pedestrian facilities, for example, making them uh, ADA accessible, making sure that there are curb ramps, making sure that the, the barriers, whether that's um, tree roots or, or um, uh, poor quality of the sidewalk, that's important for their transportation use. They need better access to their uh, health and medical appointments. So lots of really good information and feedback that we're getting and that we continue to receive. I mentioned, this is uh, giving a little teaser there. Um, we are continuing to do more outreach. In addition to the online open house, we've been doing some targeted focus groups. We've reached out to five, um, five focus groups to try to reach um, more underrepresented communities. We're gonna uh, soon reach out to the business community and the military groups. And we are uh, on the road uh, virtually uh, trying to reach uh, other organizations so that we can get this word out about what's in the draft transportation plan. So now I'm gonna move over into some very quick highlights and preview of what is in the plan. So we are planning out to 2050, so a 28 year period, and it is a $300 billion of investment. That is, a, that is a big number, but it is very consistent with prior plans. And we do this, if I haven't mentioned this yet, we are required to uh, develop a new regional transportation plan every four years. As has been our priority for many cycles, um, the first priority is maintaining and preserving the existing transportation system. So over half of the plan's investments are to maintain, preserve, and operate the existing system. For the balance of investments for system improvements, 70% of those system improvements are, are uh, aimed towards local and regional transit. We also have what we call the financial strategy of the plan. And so what we do while that $300 billion is a large number, we look at all of the available revenues for transportation investments on the books today throughout the region from cities and transit agencies to the state. We forecast what those uh, revenues will produce into the future. And the 84% of the plan can be funded with those current law revenues that are on the books today. The remaining 16% we identify a menu of options of new revenue sources that are feasible and achievable to help fund the balance of the plan. And we provide more information in the draft plan about what those sources are, as well as some of the trends. We've had uh, good success in the region over the last decade at uh, passing new transportation packages and local levies and things of that nature. So it is a, it is a very um, feasible and reasonable plan of action, we believe. And it does assume that the, especially with improved fuel economy of our vehicles, the gas tax is a declining revenue source and some movement into the future and a transition to a uh, road usage charge. 
Lastly, um, I mentioned that 70% of the plan's system improvements are focused on transit that will result in, by 2050, 36 bus rapid transit routes, 10 passenger only ferry routes, and 116 miles of light rail with over 80 stations. And this, the next two slides, you'll be able to see this is a map of the 2018 high capacity transit network. We have, uh, for uh, a variety of reasons, which I won't get into the details of, um, our base year for this plan is 2018. And you can see this is the extent of the high capacity transit in place in 2018. And compare that and contrast that to the high capacity transit network by 2050. It is a significant expansion and it is reaching those areas where that 1.6 million people I mentioned at the top of the top of the deck, um, where we expect that growth to occur, this high capacity transit network is really reaching and serving those populations. So a little bit about what you'll see in the plan in terms of performance measures. We have a wide variety of different performance metrics that we report on. I mentioned we are a large four county region. And instead of just reporting out on the regional uh, level for each of these performance metrics, to the extent that it's practical, we go sub-regional. So we are able to report on uh, metrics by county in some cases, by different regional geographies, as well as what we refer to as our equity focus areas. And these are our um, areas where there are um, higher percentages of certain populations above the regional average. For example, people of color, people of low incomes, older adults and youth, people with limited English proficiency and people with disabilities. And I'm gonna give you a couple of snapshots of some of those performance metrics and you'll see some examples of, of the different range of geographies that the plan will report on. So here's our first metric. With that significant transit expansion, transit boardings are forecasted to more than triple by 2050. And this again, high capacity transit investments in rail, bus rapid transit and passenger only ferries. Another example metric is how we access that system. So by 2050, almost 60% of households will live within a half a mile of high capacity transit. And the graph on the slide uh, demonstrates, as I was mentioning earlier on the right-hand side, you can see that we can report on this metric at the regional scale, but then we're also able to report on various sub-geographies, and these happen to be the uh, regional geographies as identified in Vision 2050. Another metric, by 2050, the average person is expected to walk and bike more, so 21% more than today. And again, this is due to the focused growth and the policies and the investments in the regional transportation plan. And the chart illustrates, an, again, an example of the regional metric on the right-hand side. And then we're also looking at the, um, the, the growth in walking and biking for people of color and people of lower income. This one, for some reason, I always uh, stumble over my own tongue, <laughs> but today, as you all know, congestion is real. Uh, the average household spends an additional 62 hours a year traveling due to congestion uh, in 2018. But again, with all of those investments and the focused growth and the policies and vision and the regional transportation plan, there is expected to be a reduction um, for average households over the base year by 2050. So the average household is forecast to spend 53 uh, additional hours each year in congestion, which is a 15% reduction over the base year. There is a much better way of saying that, and I stumbled a little bit over it, but you can see that there is a reduction from the base year in terms of time spent sitting in traffic. And now we turn our attention to miles driven. So you can see in the base year right now, the average household drives almost 16,000 miles per year. And again, with all of the investments that we've talked about by, the, by 2050, that there is expected to be a 23% reduction in the amount driven by households. This is our chart related to climate change and meeting our climate goals. Since 2010, we've had a four part, an adopted four part greenhouse gas strategy in the regional transportation plan. And one thing I should mention is that the, the, the state and the regional climate goals capture all of the various emissions that uh, contribute to uh, climate change. PSRC's work, we focus only on on-road transportation. 
And it's so when we talk about our emissions analysis, when we talk about metrics, we are really talking about on road transportation emissions as it is influenced by land use, pricing, transportation choices, and technology. And so that's just a, a little bit of, of foundational grounding there. And we do believe that with aggressive actions, we are able to achieve our goals by 2050. And the graph shows that if we implement the regional growth strategy and vision 2050, with the significant expansion of high capacity transit and the regional transportation plan, as well as some of our pricing assumptions, we will continue to make progress and reduce emissions into the future, but alone they are not enough to, to get us there. And so we do need to rely on decarbonizing our transportation system and transitioning to a zero emission future. And we have some assumptions about what that looks like in terms of the percentage of the passenger vehicle fleet, as well as the percentage of the um, freight vehicle fleet. Uh, and again, with, with some aggressive uh, and commitment committed actions, we believe that this is feasible by 2050. So it's time for our second poll. And we have a list of transportation priorities and we are curious to find out what are your top three priorities. So Michaela, take it away. Okay, are we ready with results yet? There we go, perfect. It looks like we picked up a few attendees, which is great. So it looks like reliable, well-connected transit is the, uh, shows the majority, the top one, followed by um, complete network for bicycles and pedestrians, expanded transit, reliable, well-maintained roads and highways, as well as some interest in high-speed rail, faster and more direct ferries and electric vehicle charging stations. So this is great, thank you. And it, again, it's we are seeing those consistent themes from uh, the chart I'm, I showed earlier uh, and all of the outreach that we're receiving. So thank you for your feedback. Gonna move on then to our online open house. So this is the third of our public webinars. This is the, um, the web link for our online open house. And I'm just gonna walk through a little bit of, if you haven't looked at it yet, we certainly hope you do and uh, uh, sharing with you what this looks like. So uh, the main page, you'll see some links. We have done 12 short videos on some key topic areas. These are two to four minute videos that introduce the topic, whether that's freight or safety or our financial strategy. And then uh, below the video, you'll be able to find some uh, more direct links. You'll be able to find information on the entire plan, uh, individual chapters of the plan, as well as appendices. This is a, a split view of what it looks like if you click on the, um, the page that will take you to our short videos. Again, we have 12 of them. And then if you happen to click on the equity uh, link, this is it would take you to about a four and a half minute or almost five minute video introducing the topic of how equity is addressed in the regional transportation plan. And you can see below that video, it points to our regional equity analysis, which is an appendix, as well as the uh, section of the chapter two where equity is further uh, further discussed. And equity is one of those uh, six key policy focus areas and it is cross-cutting throughout all elements of the plan. You can also see from the online open house on the right-hand side, as I mentioned, you can view the draft plan by chapter, the full plan or appendices. There's also a comment form on the draft regional transportation plan directly from this online open house. Our schedule, uh, we released the public comment period January 13th. We will have that open through the end of February. All of the feedback that we're receiving, we will take to our board. We've all, all already provided them a lot of information on the feedback we've received to date. We will gather all of the public comments and share those with the boards in March and April. 
We will also have a full report and every comment will be identified and posted on our website. Uh, the boards are expected to take recommendation action in April, and then our full General Assembly, which is all of our member agencies, are scheduled to take to adopt the plan in late May. And with that, Ben, I'll turn it back over to you for some uh, questions. Great. Thank you, Kelly. Um, we have a few questions queued up, um, so please put your questions in the Q&A if you'd like to ask, ask some questions, clarifying or otherwise. Um, the first, Kelly, is about the opportunity mapping um, that uh, this uh, attendee ran across on our webpage. And so for those of you who haven't aren't familiar with that, we've done some research and created some tools where we have evaluated um, by census tract around the region um, various various aspects of what what's called access to opportunity. And um, that can be that, that that's a, it's an index made up of, quality of transportation, health outcomes, access to um, open space, job opportunities, housing stability, and so forth. Um, and the question really is um, about the calculation of those values and how it's been reviewed um, by researchers, how it, it, is it su suitable for long range planning? And then also, of course, how um, opportunity mapping is used in transportation planning. So I'll talk about the first part, Kelly, and maybe you can talk about how we use it as part of the project selection process okay. and in um, other parts for our transportation planning. So um, we worked, um, oh, a half dec decade or more ago with the Kirwan Institute from the Ohio State University, um, who are some of the pioneers of this type of opportunity mapping. There's a research institute at that university um, they worked with us to develop the index to customize it for our region using data sources that are available and reliable for the region and at um, various more granular levels. And so um, if you look on the PSRC website, if you, you can um, search on opportunity mapping towards the bottom of the page, there are some linked reports, technical reports and background reports, and even one pager is describing the various metrics um, how, what data we use, the data sources, and then how they are actually calculated. So I'd point you to that um, for just general background on opportunity mapping. I'd also say that um, after doing that work, people really responded well to it. We were asked to, to see if we could develop something called um, a displacement risk um, analysis, a, a similar mapping tool, interactive mapping tool, where we could look at various parts of the region and um, the, the risk for displacement based upon growth and um, other factors. And so that's a, an, another tool that we've been using here at PSRC in evaluating our transportation plan and transportation projects. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kelly and Craig, our director of data may also have um, some words of wisdom on both of those um, data products as well. Sure, and I'll just I'll just kind of expand briefly. I, I do believe we, we have a lot more information in the regional equity analysis appendix on how all of those topic areas are evaluated and addressed in the in the long range plan. But Ben mentioned our funding process, and so the uh, you know our demographic data and opportunity mapping are two resources that are also provided when we conduct our project selection, our, our competitions for the federal funds that we manage, um, and we have some questions related to how transportation projects are serving um, historically underrepresented communities in our equity focus areas. And those resources are, are uh, available for um, jurisdictions to take a look at where's their project location in relationship to these areas of, of low opportunity as, a, as an example, leading to high opportunity. And it's just one more resource for them to, to kind of put the projects and the investments in context of, of local community needs. Craig, anything to add from your perspective? I think you and Ben covered it really well. Great. Thank you, Craig. Um, so the next question, um, Kelly, it has to do with VMT. And so this attendee is um, wondering, uh, understands that the, the VMT numbers that you cited were by household. Um, what does the total VMT look like? Uh, so because the data is by household, there will be more households. And so total VMT could still be going up. Is that correct? Yes, and I, I have a terrible memory and I don't have all of my statistics open in front of me. So, and since I'm sharing my screen, I can't go look that up. So I might punt over to our director of data to help me answer that question. 
Yes, um, and so you are correct in your your question that the region is growing by over 40%. So it's about a 42% increase in the number of people living in the region and total VMT is increasing about 19% over what it is in the base year. Great. Thank you, Craig. And if there are any follow-up questions, please put, put them in the, the Q&A and we can um, address those as well. The next question I see is um, some thanks for our attention to sidewalks and wa walking and rolling. Um, and the question is, are sidewalks on arterials the right way to evaluate this? Um, this person would rather not walk along, along a major arterial and it said, it, instead it seems like connectivity is a better metric. For example, is it easy and pleasant to get from A to B without being cut off by a freeway or arterial with inadequate crossings? Well, I'll, I will attempt to, I'll, I'll at least provide some information. It's a great question. And I believe Sarah Gutschow, who manages our bicycle pedestrian program is also on the line. And Sarah, feel free to jump in if you have anything to add. I, I think, you know, it's a, it's a really good point um, that, you know, just by the nature, the size of our region, we just can't track every facility and every sidewalk. We just simply don't have the capacity to do that. Um, I think the, uh, this was the first time ever we had, gone out and gathered data on the location of sidewalk facilities, even at that arterial level. So this was a huge step up for us, no pun intended. And so we're going to evaluate how, um, how often we update that. I can pretty much guarantee we will never have the capacity to gather every single facility throughout the region. But in answer to your connectivity question, I think that is another benefit of our visualization tool is you can see all of these things rather than just talking about how many sidewalks exist or how many, how, what percentage of the system has a gap. You can really zoom into areas and actually see what's going on. You can see um, where they are in location to have higher speed roads. You can see where they are in terms of connecting to, and this is the, the, the example I always give is where they're connecting to transit and are there gaps. Um, we don't have condition data for, uh, at this stage either, but I think the visualization tool and really looking at the context of, of what's being connected and how this is one system being built, I think that's where the value is added. But maybe I'll just call on Sarah to see if there's anything um, you would add since Sarah, you were so close to gathering all of that data and looking at all of the statistics. Thanks, Kelly. Um, I would just add that that question is definitely on our radar. Um, um, connectivity is a major emphasis and looking at different ways to evaluate connectivity. So that's something we'll be looking at going forward. If there's other data we could collect or look at that would help us answer that question about uh, the best way to look at connectivity on a more local scale. And the only thing I would add from the modeling and data perspective is um, just kind of highlighting that um, one of the proxies we use is intersection density. And so we try to look at the, the density of the grid to actually kind of understand connectivity and how it impacts access, especially in our, our modeling and how access to say our transit system occurs. And so when we do that intersection density, we're actually using an all streets network from if, not to get too technical, but people have heard about open street map. There's basically an online open source of kind of every road and walkway that exists um, in the world. And so we use OpenStreetMap to, to get that intersection density variable. And that's actually an important one in the modeling, which is a key input into what we saw in some of the slides that show the outputs. So we are, so we are definitely considering um, connectivity below just the arterial levels in our analysis as well. Well, thank you, Craig. Um, you know, I don't see any more questions. Ah, one just popped up because I, I have a couple of questions up my sleeve if um, if you all don't ask any questions, but there's a new one just came up. Um, what is our communication plan for reaching the general public versus special interest groups that follow our process more closely? It feels like we have to dig to find information um, and this attendee sees some room for improvement. Um, perhaps we could send information to all people at least once a year to inform them about our process, how to get involved and get more information. Um, it's an excellent point. It's a large region and it's it's difficult for us, a uh, fairly um, under the radar organization to get information out to the general public. Um, but we do our best. We use social media. We have extensive mailing lists. We, for this process, we um, prepared a social media toolkit and then kind of an information sharing toolkit for all of our members. One thing that we really rely upon at PSRC 
is for the 82 cities and towns, the four counties, the transportation agencies, and all of our partners to help get the word out. Um, many of them have much more um, refined and highly effective communications uh, you know, routes um, or platforms with local communities. And so we rely on our partners. Uh, we try that route, but we definitely rec recognize that we um, can improve. We're, we're trying new tricks all the time um, in this COVID world and in the pandemic, we've been having webinars. We've been, we go out to various community meetings um, and meet with, um, with go to people where they are at their meetings and try to get the word out. So, um, so thank you for, for that observation. It really is, it's a challenge, but it's something we, we really hope to improve on over time. Um, the next question that I see is, um, a, oh, da, 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 da. sorry, I'm trying to see if this is a new one. How about this one? Um, so uh, this person thinks that Kingston is considered an urban center, but the map that we showed doesn't show any transit link from Kingston Ferry Dock to other locations such as Paulsbo. Um, I would say that in terms of our, our designated regional centers, which are the centers that we primarily um, work with at the regional scale, Kingston is not a designated regional center. Um, it's a, a, an important local center for Kitsap County. Um, and anything else on that, Kelly, regarding any, any links between Kingston and um, locations like Paulsbo? Um, no, nothing that I can think of other than the passenger only ferry uh, investments and planning. And I'll, I, I, is Gil on the line? And I, Gil, I can, Gil I, knows more about all things uh, transit and passenger only ferry. So Gil, what would you add? Well, I think I would add, I think that what the maps are being referred to, if I'm not mistaken, uh, we're highlighting the high capacity transit uh, investments. And I believe there are local transit investments that connect uh, Kingston to other points in, in uh, Kitsap County, both today and, and in the future. Uh, I think the maps are just highlighting the high capacity transit ones like passenger only ferry, if I'm not mistaken. Yep, yeah. that's why I unmuted myself. So yeah, I was gonna say the same thing. So there's definitely transit service between um, Kingston and lots of places, even Kingston to Silverdale is an example as well. And there are investments and service for that transit service as well. So it's not just that the, the transit service is happening and what, we're, and what we highlighted was the high capacity transit service, which are um, for folks, it's bus rapid transit, light rail, transit, commuter rail, and then our ferry system, but there's a whole slew of, of other transit investments and those are also increasing significantly. So there is definitely transit connecting um, from lots of places in, in um, Kitsap County to the Kingston Ferry Dock. Hopefully that helps. Thanks, Craig. Yeah, thank you, Craig. Thanks, Gil. Um, there's an additional follow-up question about opportunity mapping in the regional plan and sort of the relationship between these regional plans and um, more implementation focused local plans like comprehensive plans. And, and so Kelly, maybe you can um, say some, a little bit about how transit agencies and transportation agencies or local jurisdictions use the regional plan to both inform um, their local planning and but then also how those plans inform the regional plan. Sure, I'll, I'll do my best and I would encourage all of you, um, Gil and Ben and Craig to, to jump in if I miss anything. I think first and foremost, it all starts with Vision 2050 and the multi-county planning policies and the regional growth strategy. Vision is certainly informing and helping to guide the local comprehensive planning updates. I think with the regional transportation plan, we are planning out that regional transportation system to help support and implement Vision 2050. And it is an, an iterative kind of a feedback loop process. So local jurisdictions through their through their existing comprehensive plan processes and their sub area plans and, and corridor plans, they have uh, proposed investments that they're planning. Those get woven into the regional transportation plan. But within the regional transportation plan, I think one of the, the, the primary benefits that I see is that we are able to then bring all this information together and provide a lot of data back in terms of what are the impacts from all of these planned investments? Where are the gaps? Where are some opportunities? So things like our performance metrics to, to share, this is how things are performing and this is where things need improvement or these are this is where things are going well. And then that visualization tool where we're re really able to see on the ground where are areas of, of growth that are being served well in the future by planned investments, where are there areas that need attention? And that is direct information that can help inform uh, local lo the local planning process. And then also those emphasis areas I mentioned, we definitely in the, in the RTP have built um, 
learned a lot and built from all of the emphasis areas in vision, climate, safety, equity, and those emphasis areas, again, we're trying to highlight and elevate and provide as much information as possible in our regional plan that can then be turned around and help to inform and guide the local plan. I'm sure there's other, other aspects that I'm, I'm just forgetting to mention, but Ben, anything you would add to that? No, I think that covers it well. The, um, the, these layers of planning from state laws to regional policies, countywide policies, local policies are all intended to work together. And um, plans like ours are primarily intended to coordinate planning across jurisdictions and to you know, think about the, these regional impacts and regional systems. Um, and we learn from local plans and projects as they're developed on the ground. And, um, and we can provide resources to help those local planning efforts um, identify those projects. So um, it is an iterative and um, a highly connected process for sure. So Ben, you mentioned the transit agencies and we certainly work closely with our transit agencies. They definitely use our long range plans to help build their kind of what's to come in terms of future transit needs. So there's definitely uh, an iterative process and a feedback loop there. And Ben, you've used the example in the past about how I mentioned early on in this presentation, we have an opportunity, we're planning for 2050. What should we be getting ahead of now? And I think the evolution of the existing high capacity transit system really started in that same way as looking at um, where were the needs before we needed them and started to, to get them off the ground. Yeah, absolutely. There's a there's a chapter in the Regional Transportation Plan, Chapter Four, that has a section called Big Ideas, and it tries to identify some of these issues of what is coming beyond the the known planned transportation projects. Uh, there are ongoing efforts from a variety of organizations around the region. Um, the, looking at things like high-speed rail um, through the Cascadia Corridor from Portland or as far south as Eugene through Washington up to Vancouver, Vancouver BC. Um, and so we want to acknowledge that those sorts of um, longer range planning efforts are happening and continue the regional conversation about them and, and understand better how um, we could advance those if that is what folks want or um, you know, add value to the conversation. Um, that does, Kelly, um, that, that sets up a question that we got in the, the Q&A, sets it up pretty well. Um, how does the transportation plan just announced yesterday um, by the state legislature align with PSRC goals and I would, I would think with this plan in particular? So I confess I have not had a chance to look at that in depth. I've only gotten kind of the, the soundbite version, but from everything that I've seen to date, I mean, we are our regional transportation plan, our our region is usually so forward thinking on these things, looking at multimodal investments, looking at maintenance and preservation being a priority and, and really tying our our plan and our vision to investments. I think we're we're probably in really good alignment, just, and again, full, full disclosure, I've not read all of the details and I haven't gone through the project list or anything like that, but the, what I've heard is focus on transit and bicycle and pedestrian facilities and maintenance and preservation, um, talking about the different funding sources. I think that's just on the surface thus far, it seems very well aligned with um, both the, the goals and the particular investments in our plan. And we always, since we are planning out to 2050, we, we always know that there's uh, short term, whether it's transportation packages or, um, you know, changes in what's going on right now, we're in a pandemic for the last two years. We always know that there's going to be short term and midterm kind of um, ebbs and flows, but we still have our eye out on that long range, long range vision and new investments. And I mentioned that we have a financial strategy that deals with uh, some portion of looking for new revenue sources. And so, it's exactly things like this, new new mm -hmm. transportation packages that would help to move and implement the, the plan. Yeah, one thing I'd add to that, Kelly, um, something that we've been highlighting a bit as part of this plan is, if you remember, Kelly mentioned that 84% of the um, identified investments in the plan are covered by projected current law revenues. Um, and that we um, have a, a strategy uh, in the plan, in our financial strategy to address the remaining 16%. And so um, some of those, um, those needs, some of those gaps were on some of the, the major facilities um, that were identified in this transportation package. So some of the gaps, some of the, some of the additional gaps may be filled by this package as well. So 
again, you know, very consistent in terms of the types of projects and the priorities that it contains. Uh, but we'll be scrubbing through that propo proposed uh, transportation package as well and seeing what it really means for, um, for this plan and how we implement it moving forward. Um, there aren't any open questions in the Q&A. So how about I ask one um, about, I, I mentioned the kinds of outreach that we try to do uh, to publicize the, the, the plan and to solicit comments. And so maybe this one might be for Sarah um, or we can see who would wanna answer it, but what kind of outreach did PSRC do to populations with specialized transportation needs like seniors or, or, and people with disabilities? I don't know if that's Sarah or Kim or Kelly, if you'd like to take it yeah, on. Yeah, and so Jean Kim is our senior planner who manages that, and I don't think she was available today. So I would turn to Gil or Kim to talk about, and I know that there was significant outreach. They had two phases of outreach to a lot of different um, mobility groups that include those populations, seniors, youth, and uh, people with disabilities to hear about their needs. And that fed into that early slide I shared with you about those particular needs. But Gil or Kim, any any details you could share on that that outreach, which I know was extensive? I think Kim should do it. This this is uh, I think she was really well involved in that. So I'll turn it to her. Sure. Uh, thanks, Gil and Kelly. So myself and Jean reached out to over 80 organizations around the region and asked them whether they would like to have us come to one of their meetings or whether they'd like to set up a meeting with us to talk to their members and um, constituents about the coordinated mobility plan, which is an appendix within, within the regional transportation plan that plans for uh, transportation for people with special transportation needs like older adults, people with disabilities, youth, et cetera. So we met with over 20 groups um, over a year and also uh, several mobility coalitions or rather mobility coalitions in each county. And in total, we engaged over 570 people. And in these meetings, we did live polling, asking them about their transportation challenges and then also what um, we should focus on as a region in terms of what we could do to meet their transportation needs. So that was a really exciting effort to undertake. We heard a lot of great information from, from many different people and that definitely was used to help inform the coordinated mobility plan. And you'll also see some of that information in the regional transportation plan under um, different sections, so. Thanks, Kim. Thank you, Kim. Well, looking, I don't see any open questions right now. We have about 10, 12 minutes left. Um, we can always wrap early if you all um, have had all your questions answered. Ah, one popped up. Um, <clears throat> let me read through it really quickly. Um, so is there a plan to address the needs of East County residents? For example, finishing and widening um, the bottlenecks on 522, State Road 522, and fi fi fixing the Highway 2. Um, there are safety and traffic congestion concerns for the people that live along Highway 2, um, and those also that use the highway for year-round recreation. So what projects are anticipated for those types of state routes? Sure. I also have to confess, I mentioned earlier, my memory is not the best. I've, I've looked <laughs> at our 400, uh, 400 project list in depth, but I since I'm sharing my screen, I can't pull it up, but we do have a project list. We also have those projects in the visualization tool on the forecast conditions map. So I do, uh, those two state routes are very familiar to me. And I, I do believe that there are investments planned um, uh, perhaps not the, the full spectrum of investments, but I do know there are investments on State Route 522 and on US 2. So I, I think it's Appendix D is the actual list yeah. of projects. But then again, so in the list of projects, you can search or you can look up specific jurisdictions that might, um, most likely those would be washed out projects. Uh, but you can also, I think, just zoom into your area in our visualization tools and see, again, we have an existing conditions portion of our tool. We have a forecast conditions, which includes those projects. So you can kind of see uh, what's being planned and comment on that. Yeah, and I have to say as um, someone who's played around with the visualization tool, it's a really easy way to um, 
pan around the region and zoom in and out and see what kinds of investments um, are near nearby where you live. A little bit easier probably than navigating the, the project list in that appendix. I know I should have all 400 memorized, but I, I just don't have it. <laughs> We'll give folks a moment for any final questions. Oh, here, here's one. Um, so is is this plan um, the basis for the competition for funding for projects? And how does that happen? How do how do projects compete for for funding? Sure. So um, we have a unique timing cycle. So we are actually about ready to we do our funding competition every two years. We update our regional transportation plan every four years. And this happens to be one of those years where they are happening at the same time. So the funding competition, we're about ready to launch our call for projects um, imminently, if not by the end of this week, then early next week. Both of them are really driven by the policy focus areas in Vision 2050. So they all, they all cover climate and safety and equity and mobility and accessibility and supporting our, our growth and supporting our, our compact urban centers. Uh, and other and manufacturing industrial centers and and other um, growth areas. Um, the regional transportation plan is really that long range look out to 2050. We have all of the programmatic the, the 300 billion dollars captures all of the transportation investments from pro, what we call programmatic, which are the things that we don't track, like maintenance and preservation, sidewalks. Um, uh, Try to vehicle purchases, things of that nature. And then we I mentioned the the four hundred projects. Those are the larger scale projects adding uh, some level of capacity, whether that's transit or roadway or ferries to the regional system. So any project that then the the funding competition then is the current look. they are they are short term. They are immediately ready to go projects moving towards implementation. Projects competing for funding need to be consistent with our regional transportation plan, either on the project list if they are that type of project or consistent. So um, very similar uh, in, in terms of the policies and objectives of the, the regional transportation system, but a different scale and a different timing point be between long range vision and projects that are looking for funding and ready to be implemented. But stay tuned, the call for project is coming out shortly. As a follow-up to that, and this is, uh, I think, a great question, is the funding directed by PSRC different than the legislative transportation-funded projects like talked, like was announced yesterday? That is a great question. Let me let me think about how best to answer that. So, we are a metropolitan planning organization, and there are, I think, fourteen of us around the state, and we each have uh, roles in distributing certain sources of federal transportation dollars, both from the Federal Highway Administration and the Federal Transit Administration. The state of Washington also has some of those, some uh, a larger share of, of dollars from the Federal Highway Administration. And each of us does things differently in terms of we set our, you know, throughout the state, each region has their own long range planning process. They have their own prioritization process in terms of aligning the investments to the that region's policy priorities, as does the state. The state has a tougher job, one might argue, because they have to deal with uh, a diverse, much more diverse set of investments and, and areas around the region. So, or excuse me, around, around the state from uh, urban areas like ours to, you know, eastern Washington, um, central Washington. So, we have a very specific, um, very detailed set of project ev evaluation criteria that align with our policies and goals and Vision 2050. The state has um, different funding sources and different priorities and how they select projects might be different. Um, I'm not sure I'm completely answering the question, but I think there, what we've seen is in terms of like, just referring back to the transportation packages we were saying earlier, what we're seeing, at least uh, from the preliminary information, that it is very much aligned with our our vision in terms of maintaining and preserving the system and focus on on uh, expansion of transit and multimodal investments. Um, but we do things differently in terms of how projects are selected. We have a very uh, detailed competitive process that's tied to a very specific set of criteria. Um, the state might have have that for some programs, but perhaps not for for others. So that's a probably not a very in depth answer, but it would probably I, I could write a chapter. I, I think I need to write a thesis to do that question justice. <laughs> and, and one thing, just to add to that, Kelly, that's important to know is that 
Um, it's very rare for a transportation project to have a single funding source that would um, right. cons- you know, design, construct by right of way, operate, you know, do the, the full um, process. So most um, projects are get funding from a variety of sources. Sometimes they'll use local dollars to match a federal grant or a state grant, or oftentimes both. And so um, larger projects in particular will have multiple funding sources um, that are for have different prioritization and competitive processes, or sometimes non-competitive processes um, if, the, if the use is local funds. So it's um, we have our niche, and Kelly always likes to say, what is the percentage of the funds? Uh, I was just going to say that. <laughs> great minds think alike. On an annual basis for all transportation expenditures in the region, we are, are the funds that we manage are about 7%. So they are very competitive and very important 7%, but we are, we are a relatively small percentage of all of the, the investments that are going on in transportation. Great. Well, we just have a couple minutes to go that addressed all the questions we had in the Q&A for now. Okay, so um, should we? Yeah, anything you'd like to add, Kelly? Maybe, yeah, maybe just talk about next steps and how folks can comment. Yeah, so just want to thank everyone for joining us this evening. We really appreciate the feedback and the great questions. We've walked through the online open house where you can find all of the information that we just talked about. Mentioned that there is a comment form on that page. So if you are uh, wishing to comment, you can you can use the form there. You can also email us your comments at transportation at psrc.org, or you can go the old fashioned route and send write a letter and put it in the mail. And there is our address. Um, and again, we the public comment period is open until February 28th. All of the comments will be going to both our transportation policy and executive boards. We will be developing a report that uh, that um, addresses every comment and that report will go on our website. And then the board will consider all of those comments, consider revisions to the draft plan. And we uh, we have a hard deadline due to federal requirements of, I think it's May, is it the 27th is our general assembly date? Some, yes. Sometime in late May. Great. Well, again, thank you all for, for attending tonight. Um, you can always follow up and with additional questions. Um, also, folks are welcome at our board meetings um, to hear their discussion. Those are uh, web streamed as well as our offices now um, open. If folks want to attend in person for the board meetings, the calendars on our website. Um, but thank you so much and, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, everyone.